Um, this we would translate this then as and he said, okay, and who said Elohim. So Elohim was introduced up here. Actually, Elohim was introduced in verse one, and it wasn't Ha Elohim. It's not like we translated this in the beginning, a God created the heavens and the earth. If this were a God indefinite, then we would certainly have the definite article down here. It would be what we call the, the anaphoric use of the uh, definite article or cat I can't remember which is what, but basically the definite article would be specifying that this is referring to an Elohim who was already introduced. But since we don't have that Elohim is definite up here as well. All right, so in the beginning, the one who is God created the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 2, we have the spirit of that one who is God was hovering on the face of the water, or the sea, the water here, Hamayim. And then in verse 3, that one who is God said, Yehi or. All right, so Yehi, let's look at that. Now, all right, and what this has done is we've got a Yod as an imperfect here, um, a yod prefix for imperfect, but it's a particular type of imperfect. It's called a jussive, which is a more um, kind of a combination of, let's say, the imperfect and the imperative. But the imperative is generally second person. Um, the jussive can be a third person imperative. And so what that sounds like in English, you know, if we if we want to issue a request or a command or an instruction or a direction in English, we would use the imperative. Pick up the book. Eat your dinner. Go to the house. These are imperatives and these are all second person. It's implied that we're speaking directly to the person that we're directing or commanding. That's what a second person imperative is. Uh, the command is given directly to the one commanded. But in both Hebrew and Greek, you can give a command or a request or an instruction or a direction to someone. <laughs> you can share a request or a direction or a command with someone who is not the addressee. So here, this being a just of being a third person sort of imperative, God is not addressing the light. If he were in addressing the light, we could use the second person imperative here. But this is a third person. So the question might be, who is God addressing? Well, he's not addressing the light yet because the light doesn't exist yet. He simply says, let there be light. Excuse me. Now that's how we translate this. The, the, I mean, if we want to literally translate this word, we would translate this word as be. He's saying be light. Okay. Now, what is he, who is he saying this to? Uh, that's one reason why we translate this as let there be light, because there doesn't have to be this sort of um, addressee here. He just says, let there be light. But even in the sentence, let there be light, who is God saying that to? And again, even if this is a figurative description of how God created light, you still ask the question from the perspective of the author, who does... Does the author intend for us to have an addressee in mind here? Is God speaking to the heavens and the earth? Is God speaking to something that is not light and telling it to become light? Or is God simply saying light should exist? Now that last option, light should exist, that is what most closely um, fits the grammar here because that's what adjustive does. It expresses, um, it, I should say it announces 
a wish or a desire on the part of the speaker. And so here God is announcing his will that light, haya, that light exist. And he does that by using the third person Joseph here. Light should exist. In other words, let there be light. The problem with the phrase, let there be light, is it sounds like when we say let, let gets associated with permission. And so it's almost like God's telling someone to allow light to exist. Well, who's stopping light from existing? Like, who is he asking, hey, let light exist? He's not asking anyone for permission. Um, when we say light should exist, like if, if we were to translate this as light should exist, it's an interesting translation because it gives you a little bit of a peek at the power of God's word here. God isn't telling something, do this. He's not, this isn't, an, he's not addressing something. This is not a second person imperative. He's not telling the heavens and the earth to become light. He's simply expressing his desire. Light should exist. And what are the very next words? Vayahi or. Light should exist. And light did exist. It's really, um, again, I go back to this sort of, I want you to see the literary quality of what this author is writing here. God said, light should exist, and light existed. Light did exist. You can translate this a lot of different ways, but I think that there, there's something here that's really... Um, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't want to overstate it, but it, it's, it, there's very beautiful quality to this. It's very, uh, I mean, it's just, it's good. I like the way that it sounds silly to say, I like the way this is written, but there's, there's something here to be appreciated that I don't think always gets appreciated. God yeah. said light should exist and light did exist. I mean, it's just that, that he said it should happen and it happened. It, it, uh, when we think of let there be light, we imagine this command ringing through the heavens. I'm not saying that can't be what happened. I'm not saying that that's not a good translation or anything. I'm just saying when we think of it as God ordering something to happen and what he orders, everyone obeys, there's more going on to that. It's not just brute force. It's brute and brute isn't the right word either. It's not force. It's just how powerful his own will is that it's, it's just from his own will, this sort of has. So anyways, I've gone on long enough about that, but I, I, I like what's going on here. And I think that this often gets overlooked how, how interesting this is.